Over the last two episodes of Two Wheels, One Compass, we've been through the lengths of Minnesota, South Dakota, and even dabbled in Nebraska a bit. By now, we've successfully crossed almost the entirety of South Dakota, which takes a good seven to nine hours, depending on the weather conditions, your speed, and the lengths of brakes you take in order to recharge your mental and physical batteries. Now the plains have given way to rocky hills and bluffs teeming with other motorcyclists and family-packed minivans from faraway states. You can feel the cool air with the altitude, you can smell the trees. This is nothing like the rest of South Dakota that we've passed through at all. We're on our way to find a dispersed camping site and we want to get there before dark. It is possible to pitch a tent in the dark, but when you think about it, would you really want to? made a wrong turn and headed to Keystone instead of Hill City, closer to Mount Rushmore. <clears throat> but uh, we found the nearest dispersed camping site and uh, it's completely surrounded on all sides by forest and there's this one deforested hill in the middle of it. I think this is gonna be where we make camp, right here. And then we'll get supplies. Whew. Okay, we're gonna set up camp. There are several categories of camping that I'll discuss over the course of my videos. These are in no way anything official, but it does break them down into different genres that explain the level of difficulty, cost, and luxury it takes to enjoy the great outdoors. This is a dispersed camping site. Dispersed camping is literally the act of going into the wild and just setting up camp for free. There are no amenities like picnic tables, fire rings, or outhouses. It's normally far from the road and isolated, meaning you'll have to haul your gear. If you're in a national or state park, check a map to be sure you can disperse camp in an area or if you can have any fires. In this particular spot, we can't have any campfires. Dispersed. I give dispersed camping a hard Hard. difficulty with no amenities, low cost, and medium equipment required because it does take some extra equipment to cook without a fire ring or any amenities. Also, dispersed camping sites like this don't allow fires unless it's a torch. Thank you. 
spending two whole days on the road, we were ready to have some fun. The whole reason we travel is to have fun, right? It's good to keep in mind that travel is not all fun and games. There are a few things that can cause you stress when you travel. The trick is, is to know what they are so you can prevent them and know how to manage them. Here are three major stressors I ask you to think about when you're on a long distance trip like this. Take into consideration your day-to-day -day endurance. If you're constantly on the road going from A to B every day, it will wear you out. The only experiencing you'll be doing will be watching everything pass by. Plan on making stops for days at a time. Know your limits and plan accordingly. Don't plan everything. If you schedule everything too tightly, it can be stressful if you don't make it to everything you want. You'll feel rushed when you make it to one destination because you'll only be thinking about the next. It's always best to plan loosely. Admit to yourself that you'll be in an area for X amount of time and ask, what can we do in this time? Sometimes you might find something that you won't want to leave. That's always the best. Don't mind letdowns. Things will not always go according to plan. Maybe you'll have engine problems. Maybe you'll get sick. Maybe the places you want to see will be inaccessible. Don't plan on everything being perfect. That high expectation causes stress when things don't always go according to plan. As I've said before, remember, drop your attachment to outcome. As you'll come to realize, I'm not the best at following my own rules. It does take some work for people like me, and it may for you too. It's just good to keep these stressors in mind. After looking at tons of literature and seeing all we'd like to do, Gabby and I decided to go to Jewel Cave. Jewel Cave is the third longest cave in the world and an underground wilderness that stretches over 180 miles. It's well known for its crystalline passages and rare cave formations. The cave was discovered in the year 1900 as a small hole that had cold air blowing out of it. In an attempt to go inside, prospectors detonated the opening with dynamite to widen the crevasse. To this day, that is the only opening to the cave that we know of. Because of the barometric pressure differences, the cave can be quite windy simply because the air pressure changes with its depth. Father of the modern American West. West. Theodore Roosevelt. Protected the cave and deemed it a national monument. There's year-round tours with varying levels of difficulty. You can go through a paved section with lights, and there's also a candlelit portion. But if you're feeling ambitious enough, not claustrophobic, spelunking is also an option. To put it lightly, spelunking isn't for people who are above a certain waistline. At the Jewel Cave, about to go into the earth to look at some really cool rock formations. We lost a very valuable piece of our equipment. A screw came loose and this uh, bike lock that has been holding on everything heavy on the back end came loose. We may have to find another one and Gabby put it correctly. I said Every anything that can go wrong is going wrong and she said damn that Murphy's Law. <laughs> so, but let's go look at some rocks. Like, Murphy strikes again. Too many people. Uh, no reservations, no nothing. They just come first come, first serve. And uh, they're all out of people that go, can go on tours. So we have to come back another day. Yay. We're going to find something else to do. Well, that's always disappointing. It's Labor Day here, so there's a lot of people out for the last few days of summer in the Midwest. We're still determined to find a cave, however. Wind Cave, which has its own national park, is in the southern tier of the Black Hills. To give you an idea of what kind of area this is, I highlighted some maps for you. The farther west you get in the United States, the more sparsely populated it is until you reach the Pacific Coast states. Much of the land out here is preserved by state and federal governments and agencies, and they have many different classifications. This region has a few types of predetermined zones. Highlighted in green are all of the national parks and monuments in the region. They include Wind Cave National Park, Badlands National Park, the Minuteman Missile National Monument, Jewel Cave, Mount Rushmore, and Devil's Tower. South Dakota has Custer State Park here too. I was wondering why the state wanted a chunk of the Black Hills for themselves until I drove through it. In my opinion, Custer State Park is the most beautiful part of South Dakota. This state really saved this bit for itself. Everything now seen in maroon is the Black Hills National Forest. It spans across the border into Wyoming and almost encompasses the entirety of this biome. 
from space, you can really tell this area is unique to its surroundings. The yellow parts now highlighted are all of the national grasslands in the region. They have their own biomes as well, and they're protected federally. There isn't much to see in them, but they're teeming with their own style of beautiful wilderness. The last part highlighted are the two closest Native American reservations. If you don't live in the heartland, it's rare to see many full-blooded Native Americans around the United States. Over the last few centuries, disease, broken treaties, massacres, and development have pushed these native groups into regions of the United States that are sometimes hundreds of miles away from the pre-Columbian territories. This part and much of the American West is an array and variety of these protected and predetermined fixed zones. This mix is one part environmental preservation, one part anthropological reservation, and all history. You will not be able to capture this on the GoPro because it has no zoom, but this will work. We got a buffalo right over there. Gabby found it. Way to go. It's a male. Definitely big, uh, big penis right there. Whew. This is the uh, first bison I've seen in the wild in my life. It's pretty cool. I didn't record any of that. <laughs> so we're in Wind Cave National Park. At Wind Cave, about to go into Wind Cave. We just head southbound on South Dakota Highway 87. There was buffalo, it is extremely scenic. And now we're going to go inside the cave before I kill the rest of the battery. Wind Cave is also one of the most extensive caves in the world. It's also still being discovered. Explorers at its deepest depths must spend days at a time underground mapping the surrounding caverns. The Lakota natives in the area considered the opening of the cave as a sacred site because of the wind that would blow out of it. It is important to their religion's origin story as they believe that this is the site where humans had first emerged from their underworld. European Americans came across the Wind Cave opening in 1881. Upon investigating the crevasse, it is said that the wind blew the hat off one pioneer's head and is still said to reside somewhere in the cave unrecovered. It's very humid with quite a bit of airflow in certain caverns. The cave is also home to a very rare geological formation, boxwork. Boxwork is seldom seen in other caves, but happens to be very abundant here. It occurs when mineral calcite fills in cracks around broken rock before the cave is formed. When eroded and the cave is created, the fillings between the rocks erode slower than the rocks themselves, leaving a honeycomb crisscross pattern that is known as boxwork. No other cave in the world has as much of this anomalous formation as Wind Cave. The good thing about this cave is that it comes with its own national park and therefore there's a lot of good funding. There are several different tours that one can take with developed trails and spelunking as well. There are evening campfire talks regarding the history and biology of the park as well as Lakota culture. Aside from the cave, Wind Cave National Park also has a first come first serve campground with primitive camping amenities, 30 miles of hiking trails, picnic areas, rivers, canyons, forests, bluffs, horseback riding and wildlife such as bison and prairie dogs. Dispersed camping is also allowed in the park with a permit. This region is teeming with secrets above and amongst the canopy, on the ground, and under the earth. It's good to finally be living the moto camping life out here. After commuting a fair bit around the area, eating and touring the caves, dark was approaching and we'd figured we'd stop for the night. The days are also getting shorter and the wind is blowing colder. So ends this chapter of Two Wheels, One Compass. Science. Until next time.